Another small difference between tables and data frames. So here we are creating a table. This time we are using the function table, not triple. So this function is just like creating a data frame with data dot frame in the sense that you specify the columns. So for in this example, we've got a column called X, which contains the values one to five and a column called Y, which is just one, uh, one, 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 one. So you know that uh, R will automatically convert that into a matching a column of matching length, a vector of matching length. So that works. This is where the novelty comes. You can do, I'm creating a third column with values calculated from the prior two columns, x squared plus two plus x squared plus y. This is calculated from the prior two columns and this works with tables, okay? But as with the function data dot frame, this will not work. So I'm doing the exact same thing except that instead of the function table, I'm saying data dot frame. So up to this is all right. But when we do this, this fails, okay? Because uh, the data date uh, dot frame function doesn't take these two values into account while calculating z and so you get an error message okay it says object y not found that's because it was able to do this you know x and y these it was able to do but in it, when it was calculating z it was unable to find the value of y because that's just how that particular function works whereas the table function is fine when you're calculating z it already has assigned these two values and therefore both X and Y are available for this. Admittedly, this is not something we do quite often, but again, just to show you that there are these small differences. One other interesting way to look at tables is that they actually, in many instances, do less than data frames. And that is sometimes a good thing. So for example, tables do not change column names. If you remember when you used uh, data frames, if you read data from a CSV file and you had a column name with spaces, for example, obviously uh, data frames don't allow column names with spaces and therefore the data, uh, the read.csv function would change those column names suitably. Okay, but tibbles do not change column names. It'll take them as they are and we will shortly see how it manages to do that. And tables also do not change column types, okay? So you already know that when you have uh, data frames and when you're reading from a, re uh, from a CSV file, by default, the read.csv function will convert character columns into factors. Tables don't do that. So whatever characters, uh, columns are read in, they're just read in as factors, okay? Again, here I'm talking about the read underscore CSV function. Okay, so read underscore CSV doesn't do any of those changes. It'll come in as character. You convert it to a factor if you so want to do. And the other beautiful thing about tables, sometimes convenient, is that it allows non-standard column names. As we've already pointed out, in data frames, you cannot have column names with spaces, for example. With tables, you can. With data frames, you can't have column names which are just numbers like 1999. But with tables, you can. And the list goes on. You know, you can even use special characters in column names with tables, but you could not do that with data frames. So let's see an example. Of course, this example, I would forewarn you, is quite uh, extreme. But there's one important point you need to take away from this, so watch closely. So you've got TB, and again, it's a table. I'm creating it with the table function. And notice the name of the first column, right, is a smiley, actually. It's a colon followed by a parenthesis. Looks like a smiley. And when you use non-standard column names, only when you use non-standard column names, you should enclose the column names in backticks. Okay, this is not a quote character. This is a backtick character. And the backtick character is the one that is uh, just below the escape key on a keyboard. Okay, right below the escape key, you see the key with uh, uh, a backtick and a tilde on top of it. So backtick is what is being used here. So you should surround these with backticks, only when they're non-standard. So don't think of it as something that is common. It's only when the column name is non-standard in that 
it's not all characters it has you know it's got some spaces or other it uses special characters in those cases you should put black tick but not in other cases now here is a column name which is just a space of course we would not do this which is showing you that it's possible okay so once again because it's non standard it's surrounded with black ticks and a column name which is just a pure number this is something we may actually do and again surrounded by back ticks okay now don't think of back ticks as being essential for tables or anything when your column name is non standard use back ticks don't use back ticks otherwise so now when you print out the table okay so again just specifying that this is needed only for non standard column names okay so when you actually print out the table you in fact see that the column names are as intended a smiley and a space and the number 2000 and everything works fine and notice that all of the data has been read in as character not as factor but of course this time we are not using the read.csv function we are just using the table function Let's now take a look at the triple function, which we have already encountered once. It's just a convenient way of creating short tables while you're writing code. This is not something we'll be using a lot in practical processing, but you need to understand that there is such a function. It's quite useful occasionally. And then the logic of the name triple is that it's a transposed table in the sense that normally when you create a data frame with the data dot frame function, we tend to specify the data in the form of columns. We say, here's the name of the first column, here are its values. Here's the name of the second column, here are its values, and so on. But here, with triple function, we have a way of specifying the data in terms of the rows, which is more common uh, for us. It's more natural for us to do that, okay? And the way to do that is to use the triple function and then First, give the names of the columns, separated by commas, of course, and preceded by a tilde to tell the system that these are the column names. Okay, And then it's conventional to put a comment just to delineate the columns so that we can line up all the values for each column right below them. Okay, Strictly, this is not needed, but it's very convenient visually. Okay, So here we are putting the values. That's the first row, A2, 3.6. That's the second row. So there are two rows in this table, which is going to be the result. Okay. So here, if you look at it, it's a lot more convenient, a lot more easy for us to just see what the data is going to look like, as opposed to specifying it in the form of columns. Okay. That's what we expected, and that's what we got. So it's a convenient function. As I said earlier, that's a useful comment. It's just a comment. Notice that there is this hash sign before the line. There's nothing else other than uh, hash before that. And whatever follows the hash is just a comment. It's just for our visual convenience that this has been included. That's a useful comment. Now, with regard to printing triples, in other words, when we say printing, I'm saying on the command line in the console. So we're loading the library again. If you've been working in a session that has it loaded, you don't need to do this again. And then suppose we put the name of one of the tables in the package, the system displays the data. This much we have already seen, and we already have a good idea of how it displays. The fact I'm trying to get at is, how do you control the number of rows and the number of columns displayed? Often, the default is good enough. There's really no need for us to go and change it. I'm just showing you how you might be able to change these things in case you come across a need to do that. So here we can say there is a function called print that we have not encountered so far all the time till now when we wanted to display the contents of a data frame or a table, we've just been typing its name at the console. Uh, but you can use the function print. So if I say print flights, comma, n equals 10 and width equals minus width equals inf. Inf means infinity and what we are saying is just print everything. Don't let the uh, restriction of the width of the console limit how many columns are displayed. You understand that by default when you just print the contents of a table it's just going to print as many columns as will fit in the console. That's it. Nothing else. It's going to show the rest of the column names in the bottom. Here we are telling it explicitly just go print all the columns 
but print only 10 rows for me, n equals 10, only 10 rows. Okay, so if you do that, then what it's going to do is it's going to print 10 rows, but notice now that it's gone into continuing to print. So it printed as many columns as will fit on the console, and then it continues to print the remaining because we said width equals inf. Okay, so that's that's what happened there. You have further control. You can say options. There's a function called options, which we've used a little bit in the past. Here I'm saying tibble.printmax equals n and tibble.printmin equals m. That is what we are saying is at a minimum print m rows, but sometimes you may have a tibble that has say 15 rows. Okay. When you print the table, there's no point in the system just showing you 10 rows and not showing the remaining five rows because there are only five more rows left. Might as well show them all. Okay, so that's what this print max is controlling. So it's saying at the maximum, how many rows should you show? At the minimum, how many rows should you show? Okay, so if your data frame is less than or equal to n in terms of the number of rows, it will show all of them. Otherwise, it will show only the minimum. Okay, so if the number of rows is less than or equal to n, print all of them. Otherwise, print m. That's that's what these two things. And by default, it is 10 and 15. Right? Print min is 10, print max is 15. So if you have a table which is 15 or low, less number of rows, then it'll show the whole table. Otherwise, it'll show only 10 rows. We can, if you want, you can change these. I have not found a reason to change any of these things, but if there is a need, you could change them. Okay. Or if you always you want all of the columns to be displayed, irrespective of the width of the console, then you can say options table dot width equals inf. Always print all the columns. Now let's look at another function. Till now we have used this function called read dot csv to read data files, which are comma separated variable files, which is what we encounter most often. Uh, to read those files into R. Okay, and the result you know is a data frame. When you use read.csv, the result is a data frame. The dplyr package provides a function called read underscore csv. And read underscore csv again reads csv files, but it creates tables instead of data frames. Okay, so that's that's what it is. It's 10 times faster than read.csv. Right, which doesn't really matter if your file has, let's say, hundred thousand, just hundred rows or a thousand rows or five thousand rows. You will not see any noticeable difference if you're reading such files. Noticeable difference between read dot csv and read underscore csv. But when your files start becoming large, like for example, uh, you know, hundred and fifty thousand rows, two hundred thousand rows, a million rows, then you will find that read underscore csv does a much, much quicker job than read.csv. Okay, if you're reading a very large file with read.csv, uh, you will actually have time to take a coffee break. Okay, so that, that's the idea here. It produces tibbles as output, not just regular data frames, and it doesn't convert character values into factors. And like I already said, you know, it doesn't mangle uh, column names, all of those things. All of those things that I cited as being advantages of tibbles, th those things also it does. In the, in the slide on where I said uh, tibbles to less than data frames. Okay? So that's what happens with read underscore CSV. So if you've got character values in a column, they'll come as character values into the tibble. You then have the freedom to convert that into a factor if you want. Okay. If you have non-standard column names in your input file, those column names will be preferred as they are, uh, uh, will be retained as they are when you when it creates a table it's not going to mangle them right so that's the difference between read dot csv and read underscore csv okay so henceforth going forward we'll be using mostly read underscore csv if we are reading any data files of course a lot of our examples will be based on uh, inbuilt data frames or tables and therefore we won't have much option to use this but for assignments and so on when you're reading you could use read underscore csv. Okay. 